Lord, help us to receive and delight in the truth that you have revealed. Help us to be attentive to your truth. May your spirit come and cut to our hearts that we might see how we can apply these words in our lives, even this week. Help me, Lord, to proclaim your truth with clarity. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the psalmist wisely said in Psalm 133, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. In some respect, that's self-evident. We know how good it is when we're with a bunch of people and, and, and we agree and we're together. It's so much better than the opposite when you're with people that you disagree with. He says how wonderful it is. What, what a privilege to be with those that we are unified with. Well, we've been looking at the high priestly prayer in John 17. And today we're going to see that Jesus prays for unity among his people. We made it to verse 20, so I invite you to follow along as I read John 17, verse 20. This is the word of the Lord, God's holy, perfect, inerrant, and infallible word. Jesus prayed to his Father, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them even as you loved me. This is the word of the Lord. What we see in this portion of Jesus' prayer is that he's asking the Father for unity. He's praying for a togetherness, a oneness, a like-mindedness. He's praying that his followers would agree. He's praying against division, separation, factions. Briefly, let's note who he's praying for. It's there in verse 20. I do not ask for these only. It's probably a reference to the 11 disciples that are with him as he's praying. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So Jesus is not only praying for his disciples. This prayer is a prayer for all believers throughout history. This means that Jesus is praying for us. The night before his crucifixion, he prayed for you. The book of Romans says that he continues to intercede, to pray for us, even to this moment. So he's praying for us. But what is he praying? That's what I want us to dwell on this morning. He's praying for oneness. Listen again, verse 21. I pray that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that I have given, that you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And then he says it again, verse 23. I in them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one. In this passage, Jesus actually speaks of more than one kind of unity. Perhaps you noticed it. He actually speaks of three different unities. And so this morning, I want us to look at each of them. He prays for our union with God. He prays for God's union within the Trinity. And then he prays for our unity with one another. So let's start there in verse 23, looking at God is united, that we are united to God, rather. So we see in that first phrase there in verse 23, I in them. This is much like what Jesus had told the disciples that same night as he's praying this prayer. He said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. There's this connection. I'm in you, you're in me. We're united to the Savior. This is part of what he's praying for this night. That we would be united to God. Look again. We're just going to keep looking through these same verses and pulling out different themes. So look back to verse 20. 
I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they may be in us. So that phrase, that they may be in us. This is this first union, this idea that we would be connected to God. Now, this doesn't mean that we become God, but that we are, in a real sense, united to him. Oh, what a privilege it is to be in Christ, to be connected to our God and our King. This is what happens when people put their trust in Jesus. You see, our sin separates us from God, but Jesus came that we might be reunited to God. Just think of me about the famous verse, John 3, 16. There we're told that God so loves the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, what we deserve for our sin is to perish, to die, to face condemnation, eternal condemnation. But those who trust in Jesus, who put their belief, their confidence, their hope in him, they don't perish. They have life. And as Jesus pointed out in this very prayer, eternal life is to know God. It's it's to be united with him forever. Indeed, this is why the book of John that we've been studying now for many months, why it was written at all. John tells us his purpose near the end of the book. When you get to chapter 20, he says this in verse 31. These are written so that you, that's the reader, so that you may believe That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John wants those who read this book to trust in Jesus, to believe in him, and have life eternal connected to God. Listen to how Peter puts it. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, we read these words. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. That he might bring us to God. What a summary of the gospel. This is what Jesus came to do. The righteous, the perfect one died for sinners like us. The unrighteous ones. In order that we not, not be separated from God, but be brought to God. Part of what Jesus was praying the night before his crucifixion. The night before he would pay the penalty our sin deserved. Was oh that they would be united to God. He knew his prayer would be answered. And indeed it has been. If you have never turned from your sin and trusted Jesus, you need to do so right now. You need to repent and believe. For Jesus is the only hope of being united to God and living forever and ever. So the first unity we see in this passage is how we are united to God. But secondly, we see that God is united In himself, the the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, they are united. So back to verse 23. Verse 23 says, I in them and you in me. So this is Jesus saying, the Father in the Son. He speaks of the union that they have. And what a union it is. In fact, that's been one of the big themes throughout the book of John. Jesus is speaking about how he is perfectly united with his Father. He says, I and the Father are one. And now, in a similar way, he he prays that we would be one, like they are one. But let's dwell for a little bit on the type of unity that they have. Yes, the Trinity are one in essence. But there's other aspects to this unity as well. The Father and Son are united in various ways that we see throughout this prayer. So let's just think back, look through the chapter. Look there at verse 1. The first thing we see is that the Father and Son are united in purpose. They are both equally committed to the glory of God. Verse 1 says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. He says, Glorify me, that I might glorify you. Together, they want God to be glorified. He says it again down in verse 5. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. They're united in their desire to see God glorified. Secondly, we see the Father and Son are united in mission. Look at verses 2 through 4. Verse 2. Since you 
have given him, so this is the Father giving Jesus, authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth and have accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Don't you see how the Father and Son, they're united in mission. The Father sent Jesus and Jesus gladly did exactly what the Father sent him to do. They were united in purpose and united in mission. Third, the Father and Son are united in truth. Look at verse 8. The first half of the verse, we read this. For I have given them the words that you gave me. You see, Jesus has communicated to us the words of the Father. Jesus isn't making up his own stuff. He is in perfect sync with the Father. So that his actions are the Father's actions. His words are the Father's word. The truth of the Father is the truth of the Son. They are united in truth. You see it again in verse 14. I have given them your word. They're perfectly in sync when it comes to divine truth. Finally, we see in this prayer that the Father and Son are united in love. Look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me. Here's the part I want us to note. Because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So how long has the Father loved the Son? Always, forever. He loved him before creation. The Father has always loved the Son, and likewise, the Son has always loved the Father. They are united in love. So we see all these different ways in which the triune God is united. And we will see we are united in very similar ways. So that brings us to this third category. Jesus prays that we would be united with one another. United with one another. That is, the people of God. One. Again, back to verse 23. We see all of these unities there. Here it's in this little phrase. That they may become perfectly one. This is really the dominant theme in this section. Jesus prays three times that we would be one, that we would be one, that we would be perfectly one. In case you missed it, we'll walk them through it one more time. Verse 21. That they may all be one. Skipping down to verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And then into verse 23. I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one. He says it again and again and again. Why such emphasis here? Jesus longs for his people to be united, to be together, to be walking step for step together. Jesus prays that his followers would become one. Now think with me. Who else in the scripture is said to become one? Husband and wife. Think back to Genesis, way back in chapter 2, verse 24, I believe it is. Yep. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Jesus, in Matthew 19, he quotes that very passage. And then he says this following. So in Matthew 19, verse 6, Jesus said, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So think of me about this union. The union of marriage, God creates it. And we protect it. We, we hold it together. And yet this unity really is mysterious, isn't it? I mean, man and wife, they're not the same. They're distinct. They are two different people. right? Ask any married couple. Yep, you'll know. They are not the same. They're different. And yet... There is a real union. They really are one. They're on the same page. They're, they're working towards the same goal. They're going in the same direction. They're unified. Or at least they should be. That's what a, a godly marriage looks like. There's a union where, yes, we're doing this together. So God creates the unity. And we must be careful not to break that unity. Another metaphor that's used to describe the unity of the people of God is that of the human body. So God created 
unity in our body. We, we have one body, and yet it's our job to take good care of our body and all of its various parts. We see this theme in 1 Corinthians 12. There Paul writes this, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews, Greeks, slave, free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. So we're being reminded that, okay, there's, there's one truth, there's one God, there's one gospel, and we are united into one, and into a body. In that chapter, if you read on, he describes about how each part of the body is indispensable. They all matter. It's kind of a humorous passage. He goes on to say that the hand doesn't say to the eye, I have no need of you. He asked, what would it be if the whole body were an eye? And it's just a big old blinking eyeball. I mean, that's not a body. No, we are one, and yet we're different. There's this unity amidst diversity. He summarizes down in verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually, and individually members of it. So he spends most of that chapter speaking to this issue of the unity of the body. But interestingly, Paul had already mentioned it two chapters before. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. Speaking of the gathering of communion, he says this. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the, body, the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And here's why. Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we partake of the one bread. Do you see what he's saying there? When, when we gather together and we have communion, as we will shortly, what we're doing, at least in part, is celebrating the unity that his death purchased for us. That's why we call it communion. There's a unity, this community that's, that's drawn together in Jesus. It's not just what he has done, but it's what he has made that we have to experience, that we celebrate together. Now looking back to our passage, Jesus prayed that we would be one, that we'd be perfectly one. And he doesn't use in this situation the example of the human body or of marriage. He says he wants us to be one as God is one. He says our unity is modeled after the Trinity. So look there, I think it's verse 22. The glory that you've given me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. Now that's absolutely mind-boggling. He wants us to have a unity like the unity experienced between Father, Son, and Spirit. The church is one in a real sense. And yet he's praying that we would continue to be one. I wonder this morning, is that your prayer? Is that your priority that the people of God would be united? That they would be together? That they would be unified forever? The gospel creates a unity. God is the one who has brought us together. And yet, fascinatingly, we are given the responsibility of preserving that unity, of taking good care of that unity. Much like marriage, God has joined us together. We are careful not to break it apart. We must strive against division and separation and schism. As you think throughout the New Testament, this issue gets dealt with again and again. So let me give you some examples. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 3, listen to this incredible command. Maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So God has created the unity, but it's our job to maintain it. We must preserve it. We must keep this unity from falling apart. And then we're told why in the following verses. So verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called in one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all. So he says, this is it. There's only one true salvation. There's only one God. There's only one real, true church. So we must be one. We must be united. 
If we go to Philippians, it's dealt with yet again. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 2, Paul says, Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Did you catch the repetition? I mean, four times there. He says it again and again. Look again at verse 2. Being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He calls us to, to a unity. And how is that unity preserved? How is it kept? Well, he says it's the same love. Certainly love is part of it. But look at verses 3 and 4 now. This is how we do this. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. This is immensely practical. So how are we to have union among the people of God? We gotta stop being selfish. We gotta stop being concerned with only what I want, but rather well, what is best for the whole, for the group. This is how we preserve unity. And it requires sweat, work, effort. So just think with me. Do you intentionally pursue unity? Are you striving to make sure that there's not division among the body? Or let's look at Romans chapter 12. It was read for us earlier in the service, but let's dwell upon it. Romans 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of the faith that God has assigned. Why is this we need to be humble? Well, he tells us in verse 4. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And that, that's incredible. So we're saying, don't be selfish because this is about more than you. This is about us. There's, there's this unity, this togetherness. But what does that really look like? To be unified. I mean, I think everyone recognizes, okay, unity is a good thing. We should, we should be unified. There are many distortions. There are many false unities out there. Jesus did not pray merely for tolerance. He didn't pray for apathy. He didn't pray that we would just kind of deal with one another. We would tolerate one another's differences. He didn't call us to the lowest common denominator. He didn't say, well, why can't we all just get along? No, th this was very intentional. He was calling us to something that unites us. I mean, think of the members of the Trinity. They agree with one another. They are like-minded. See, sometimes people try to, to make unity by pulling out content. We'll, we'll, we'll agree on nothing. And they see, look, we're all together. <laughs> we're just not going to fight because we're not going to talk about things. But rather, the unity that Jesus is praying for is united by truth. By content. Jesus is not praying that we're all uniform or the same. So think of a family. Are all the children uniform? No, they're different. And yet, the family, it's one family. We've already thought about marriage. The husband and wife, they're different. And yet, they make up one marriage. Our body, made up of all different parts, different members. Yet, it's one body. The Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit, they're different. And yet, they're unified. You see, true unity... Is a shared passion, a shared goal, a shared understanding, and a shared camaraderie. There's this togetherness. We've already seen that God is one in purpose, in mission, in truth, and in love. And brothers and sisters, that's how we can be united. We must strive to be united in purpose, in mission, in truth, and in love. So I want to finish our time this morning thinking through each of these categories. How is it that we practically preserve the unity that God has created in our midst? Well, first we preserve unity by being one in purpose. Now, every organization has a, a purpose statement and a mission statement. And sometimes people spend a long time trying to tweak and figure this out. 
We have it easy. God just gives us these things in the Bible. So what is our purpose? We exist to glorify God. This is why we were made. So Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So we're all going to do lots of different things. And yet in the midst of all of them, our goal, our purpose, the end for which we're striving is that God would be glorified. Our purpose, the purpose for which we belong to one another is to honor and praise the Lord. We see this in the Old Testament. The Lord told Isaiah these words. This is Isaiah 43, verse 7. Everyone who is called by my name, I created for my glory. That's interesting. So the people that God has called, the whole reason they exist, the reason they were made was for his glory. Well, what does that even mean? He makes it more clear a few verses later. Verse 21, the Lord says, the people who I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. Why did God form us? Why did he make us? That we would proclaim the greatness of God. This is our purpose. It's what unites us. Oh, that we'd be one in purpose. May we together live for the glory of God. So we preserve the unity that Jesus prayed for by being one in purpose, but also by being one in mission. One in mission. Our task has been given to us. Again, we're not just making this up. We don't get together and huddle. Okay, now what should we do? No, Jesus said, remember the Great Commission? Go therefore and make all or go therefore into all the world and make disciples. Right? Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. It's to proclaim the truth of the gospel again and again and again. And note how that mission relates in our passage to verse twenty, John seventeen verse twenty. Jesus began by saying, "I do not ask for these only, but for those who will believe in me through their word." That's interesting. It's through their word that other people come to faith. See, when someone becomes a Christian, the message of Christ becomes their message. The words of Christ become their word. You see, we have the great privilege of sharing the gospel. Every person became a Christian by receiving the good news from another Christian. Maybe it was a family member, a loved one. Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was someone who, who wrote a book. Maybe it was someone who, who broadcast something on the radio. Maybe it was one of the apostles who wrote scripture. But however it is that you came in contact with the words of the gospel, it was given to you by means of another Christian. You see, this is our mission, that we would spread out with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, how involved are you in the mission? When was the last time you told someone about the Savior? Was it this last week? Was it this last month? This last year? This is our mission. This is what we're about. We cannot keep silent. We must proclaim the Savior to those around us. My prayer is that indeed, as a church, we would be united as we are striving to be faithful to tell others about Jesus. So we preserve the unity that Jesus prayed for by being one purpose, one mission. Oh, but by being one in truth as well. You see, our unity began when we heard the truth. And our unity is held together by truth. So there is absolutely no reason for you all to be in the same room listening to me. Unless I am teaching the truth of the word of God. Brothers and sisters, what unites us is the truth. It's the authority of Scripture. It's what God has said. This is what holds us together. Sometimes in these fake attempts at unity, people say doctrine divides. It's doctrine that holds us together. It's, it's the truth of the Word of God that unites the people of God. Oh, that we would delight in what God has said. Oh, that we would be a people of the book. Throughout history, this is what has held the people of God together. Think back to the very first church, the book in Acts. Acts 2 verse 42 says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You see, this is where unity comes. When we devote ourselves to the truth of the word of God. 
Look up in the prayer to verse 17. Jesus had just prayed, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus had prayed that his people would be matured, they would be made holy by the truth of the word of God. Indeed, this is what matures us and this is what holds us together. Interestingly, verse 22, this is probably the most confusing part of the passage. I think this is dealing with the same issue. Verse 22, he says, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Now we know we don't get all the glory of Jesus, right? Look down at verse 24. He's going to pray that one day we see his glory. So, so what's he talking about, verse 22? There, here's what I think is going on. Jesus is saying, I have revealed and made known the greatness of God to you. I, I have given you the truth. And now that you have that truth, it makes you one. We are united in what has been revealed to us. What brings us together keeps us together. What unites the people of God is the gospel of truth. So brothers and sisters, may we together hold tightly to the word of truth. We've seen that we preserve the unity that Jesus prayed for by being one in purpose, one in mission, one in truth. Now one in love. Perhaps the most practical of them all. Look at verse 23. When you get to the very end of the verse, we read this. You sent me and loved them even as you loved me. That, that's interesting. Did you catch that? Jesus is saying that the Father loves the disciples as much as he loves Jesus. To the same degree that the Father loves the Son, he loves us. That sounds like blasphemy. I mean, how could God love me as much as he loves Jesus? It's because we are in him. We are connected to him. Indeed, the Father loves us to the same degree that he loves Jesus. Wow, what a mind-boggling truth. And because we have been so loved, we are to love. 1 John 4.19 says this. We love because he first loved us. Because we have been loved, we are lovers. We love one another. Over and over again, this theme is brought up in the New Testament. It's the glue that holds us together in perfect harmony. It's love. Here's some examples. We see this love for one another reflected in all of the one another commands. So the New Testament calls us to bear one another's burdens, to instruct one another, forgive one another, pray for one another, submit to one another, encourage one another. All of those are ways in which we show love and care and concern for one another. Think back to the human body. We love our body by caring for it, every part of it. When we're hungry, we feed it. When we're cold, we put a coat on. We care for our body. We love our body because it's ours. Oh, that we would love the church in that same way, that we would love one another. Again, the illustration of marriage. Paul says a husband, when he loves his wife, he's loving himself for they are one flesh. Oh, that we would be a united people who love one another in all that we say and do. But that's not the end. There's something else from this passage we need to squeeze out. Don't miss what all this loving unity leads to. It's in both verse 21 and verse 23. Look back to 21 first. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are me and I in them, that they may be in us. And here's the, the conclusion. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, this love and unity, is, it doesn't stop here. Yes, we are to be unified for the sake of the world, so that the world may come to believe, that they might see and know the truth. You see it again in verse 23. I in them, you and me. That they may be perfectly one. Here's the phrase. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So our loving unity, although it's, it's good for us, it benefits everyone around us as well. Certainly this is what Jesus had in mind back in chapter 13 when he said this, verse 34. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. 
Don't you see, when we have a church filled with loving unity, it, it is a bold and powerful testimony to the world. A church filled with loving unity is like a giant billboard declaring the love of God. Oh, may we be unified in purpose, in mission, in truth, and in love. Along with Jesus, my prayer for our congregation is that we would be one, that we would be perfectly one. Let's pray. Lord, we rejoice in the unity that you have created. We thank you for the unity that you have purchased by the blood of the lamb who was slain for us. And Lord, we do pray that you would help us, that you would help us be unified, help us be like-minded, Help us to have the same love and the same mind. Help us not to be selfish and divided, but help us to be united in purpose, in mission, in our commitment to the truth, and in our active love towards one another. And Lord, we do pray that you would use all these things for the advancement of the gospel throughout the world. Again, you are the all-wise God who uses all things for your good even the unity of your church. We pray this in the name of Jesus.